welcome to the Signature Sip Podcast, a real estate podcast with myself, John Steingraber, and my beautiful wife, Michelle Pice. Cheers to the beginning of Signature Sip. I feel like now we're back and we have a lot to give. We have a lot to offer. Till this day, by the way, I have to say, the excitement happens the second I land the deal, not when I get paid. It's the art of the just landing that. Up. Right, it's the chase. Not only are we going to be giving a lot of wisdom and knowledge and experiences and stories, but we're going to bring on guests. I bartended, babe. So something that you and I have in common, even though. Babe, you bartended for how long? Three months. A day or two? I it, it's a podcast. <laughs> So you were like eating a tosta mista in Emily's Bakery. Um, I think I was having a pastel de nata. Okay, pastel de nata. <laughs> and a galon. And if you're a realtor, if you're an investor, you're going to want to subscribe to this podcast. Welcome everybody to a new episode of The Signature Sip. I feel like we have a recurring guest Used to be the Michelle and John show, but maybe it's the Michelle, John, and Mike <laughs> show. Welcome back, Mr. Gomes, our CEO. First of all, we're going to call this signature sip. Can we have some drinks here? Water? Yeah, what would you no? like? Coffee? <laughs> You're, we should probably bring some coffee. We're actually on a coffee. Well, John's on a coffee cleanse. He hasn't drank coffee in months. Um, Good for John. Yeah. He looks great. So, Look at him. Look at him. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. So <laughs> Amazing. Today's topic is how to start and quickly grow your own real estate brokerage. I just have to say, I don't think there's uh, such thing as quick in growing a successful real estate brokerage. So the audience is going to get a ton of value because um, John and Mike are responsible for the growth of Signature Realty. They are driving the driving force behind our growth. So we're going to have a, a lot of questions today for you from the audience. And also, um, I want to hear your insights. And I'm sure independent brokerages out there that are listening to this, you guys are going to get a lot of tips and tricks um, that we're just going to share with you guys. So I founded the company when I was 29. I'm 44. So that was... Um, Damn! <laughs> I had <to>. <laughs> It's <laughs> a Kevin Hart you thing. Got, I know. I know. Yeah, what a journey it's been. I mean, what are you trying to... Come on, guys. Babe, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's <laughs> like a viral joke. I'll, show, I'll send it to you. It is, it is a viral It's joke. very okay. funny. Joke's on me. But when I started the... When I founded the company, I was 29 years old. I had well, you're young. Wow. I was really young and yeah. I don't see a lot of people that age starting brokerages. Like a lot of people that are starting brokerages are 40, 45 plus. They've had some success in the business. Yeah. And then they started. <laughs> now so kudos. Nobody started. Kudos to you. I forgot. Like I forgot how young you were. I was 20. And you yeah. know what? I think I think people were just burned out. That's why yeah. you're doing it at 40 because you've been hustling for so many years. You're like, okay, what's the next move? Let me right. just open up a brokerage. Yeah. But guys, the hustle doesn't end. I think you're hustling more when you do open up a brokerage, right? Because there's just so many different uh, parts to, to it all. I was 29. I had been in the business since 2004. So I was five years in. Okay, I had opened up... Uh, no, 2010 you opened. 2009. Officially you opened 2010. Right. Was it 2010, 2009? Yep. It was November 2009. It was no? 2010. Okay, well, he knows the numbers. <laughs> so then I was 30. Woo, woo, was I 29 woo, woo. or 30? All right, maybe I was 30. I just keep getting... Early 2010. Them. Perfect. Yeah. 29, 30, whatever, tomato, tomato. I was um, late 20s, early 30s when I opened up. I had opened up with a partner at the time, and we didn't have much of a game plan. It was more of like, okay, I had been a producer in the business for for many years. My partner at the time had been doing this for 30, 40 plus years. He had an office in the town, Springfield, New Jersey, where I did the majority of my sales at the time. And I was just fed up with the whole corporate world and the big box brokerages. I just, mm -hmm. I, it just wasn't for me. So it, it became Signature Village. It just really became out of frustration with all the other brokerages out there. And I just didn't feel like I had a home or a place. Um, so we didn't really have a plan. We just said, okay, let's just open up and let's just, you know, see how it goes. And I think before the journey was tough because we were mom and shop, literally, we were small. I think I had 30 to 35 agents before you guys or you, John, started yeah. to kind of come into the business. So, yeah, I, and I think when you started out, it was very different, right? Because you had the traditional commission splits. That's right. And as a top producing agent, being at a traditional brokerage, giving up, a huge percentage of your entire amount of money, not having a cap, like nowadays many companies, including us, have a cap model, it justified you saying, well, let me open up my own office, rent real estate, take on all the expenses, hire a receptionist, you know, 
get for sell signs, all the stuff that kind of comes with opening up your own brokerage, it was more justified. Now you don't see people opening up brokerages because it almost doesn't make sense to open up a brokerage with all those expenses when you could just be at a brokerage like ours and then have a very small amount of an expense on the, you know, to the brokerage and then be able to operate your business. So, you know, I think that's important to kind of talk about because that was probably a big part of it. Like, Oh, I'm giving this huge chunk. You were killing it, right? Like you were making a lot of money selling a ton of homes when you did that. And then when you open up a brokerage, like you're keeping that money. But I think I took a step back actually. So well, I that's what I'm saying. Like a, a lot of people don't realize like, well, your production is not going to stay the same if you open up a brokerage probably no. because you have to deal with all the other stuff. Well, remember, and I also had a partner, so everything was split 50-50 no matter what. Right. So yes, the commission models at the time were a little bit more f in favor of the broker, not necessarily the agent. Um, but then in my case, I had my production, and then I also, whatever I made, I had to split it with my partner. But he was splitting his with yours. That with is, you. That's right. 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 So you right. guys, if you guys were equal and you started this together, then you would be fine. Right. Things well. change down the line. Right. But that was the idea. Like right. that made sense. Like you're doing a million, I'm doing a million. I get your 500, you get my 500. I mean, you end up keeping 100% of your money if that's the case. Right. But it wasn't the case because I actually, um, opening up the brokerage, I took a couple of steps back in my production because I was still producing, but you're right. also a brand new company now and now you're remarketing and now you have no track record, right? You go from a big box brand to, you know, independent starting out. Mm -hmm. Um, you're recruiting, and, you're supporting. And the market, also yeah. when I opened, it was Forms. 2009, 2010. Forms, yeah. So you had the whole economic, you know, catastrophe that happened right. um, with everything. So it was a tough time. Um, but then again, you also had uh, expenses, salaries that I didn't have before. You had rent, you had utilities, you had just, you know, MLSs and fees and everything mm -hmm. else. So it added up. So the first couple of years... Uh, was definitely um, a challenge. Uh, luckily, we, we were still very successful, but the reason the brokerage did well uh, was because my partner and I were both producers. If we were not producers, I don't know if it had survived at the point, at the time, because we had literally maybe 30, 35 agents, half of them produced, right? It's like any business, it's a numbers game. Um, but it was also very different then. We didn't have what we had now. And so five years later, uh, my partner and I had decided this just wasn't um, the right fit, or I had decided this wasn't the right fit, and I ended up going on my own. And it was right around that time that John and I got together, and um, he started to really get involved with the brokerage and with the growth of the company. I did what I do best, which is the production. I, you know, was definitely, definitely not the best manager, nor did I really enjoy it. I enjoyed what I enjoyed and what I was good at. And John um, took a little bit of convincing. Uh, he actually had you had gave you had given up a seven figure salary at the time. You were working for Not Fortune salary, Builders. It was commission based. Yeah, but you were making seven seven figures. Yeah, and um, well, that's at least what you told me when I tried to recruit you. <laughs> so. No, it was seven figures, but it wasn't a salary. It wasn't a salary. Meaning, was I would go out and I would sell and I would make a commission. I, that's right. If I didn't sell anything, I made no money. Right, but you gave that up. Yeah. because you saw, a, you had a vision and you saw this company really going to a whole nother level, which I at the time never thought I'd be sitting here and talking about the growth. And obviously that the growth stemmed from, you know, you. And then also at the time we were growing so quickly, you needed your you know, right hand man. And that's where you came in. Yeah. And well, that's he, not where he came in. That's not how it worked. He came in on your team. No, I'm talking about the CEO. She's skipping a bunch of parts. Yeah, I mean, we don't have, I mean, we, I mean, how many hours? <laughs> no, for the know, sake of time. I know we for the sake the, of time. No, we grew, we grew, yeah. the, we grew the company 80, 100, whatever it was. And then uh, Mike. 87 to be Mike, right. who was on Mike my team. Mike was a top team producing agent. At the Michelle Price It's group. important to yes. give his background That's because right. he's, you know, he did what? $500,000 in GCI the last year uh, that you were with him. 550, but no What is it? 550, but no risk. I mean, he was a top, you know, he was a top agent on top my team. agent on That's the right. team. Um, you and Chad were right there, right? And um, then you you decided you. <laughs> no, Chad is Chad is. Uh, um, Chad helped motivate. Uh, yeah, a, a big reason why I got there for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then um, Mike decided he wanted to not hustle so hard and not work on 
you know, being an agent, he wanted to be into the management role. Yeah, I, I, I mean, you know, I think people go in stages also, like every 10 years, I feel that you develop a passion for something else. And, you know, I was helping out already a lot of agents in the office, just like kind of, I'm not gonna say mentoring, some people I did mentor, right? Um, meaning like I worked closely with them, I supported them, um, you know, several hours out of the day. But a lot of people just would come to me out of comfort just to ask for assistance because of the credibility, right? They're always gonna ask, oh, well, he's a 550 producer, let me ask him a question in terms of production or support, whatever the case may be. And I really started liking helping people that I wasn't close to, by the way, and I enjoyed it without any expectations. I never asked for money from any of them. I never asked to split a deal. I just did it out of- Your heart. Yeah, kindness. kindness, right? I wanted them to succeed. Like I, I was like, you know what? Nobody was there for me when I started and I know how hard that was. Let me let me do something different than pay it for it because no one actually helped me. I'm not gonna say that. Well, some people did, but I didn't have somebody that was my go-to person. So a mentor. Exactly. I wanted to provide them with that, right? And when you do that, also it's also a reflection of the company. They they like it. They'll stay. Right. Um, you know, they get. And a lot of our agents do that now. Yeah, and a lot of our agents do it. Yeah, for sure. You know. And that made you realize, like, okay, this is a role that I could take on. I can help develop other agents and grow a company. It was fulfilling. Very fulfilling. I, I think people, if you're a top producing agent, it's very different than growing a company, right? I think it's more fulfilling, growing a company versus being a top agent, in a sense that it isn't just you, right? It's you and a bunch of people growing together collectively. You know, and I just feel that also, you know, today specifically in this type of climate, um, since COVID, I think it's much harder to grow a brokerage than it ever was before because there is a lot of competition. There's a lot of younger agents coming into the business that are not attached to a brokerage, meaning that they're not loyal. They'll, they'll, they'll jump from broker to broker to broker. So it makes our job from a retention standpoint a lot more difficult. You know, and despite all of that, um, we've done a fantastic job from, I think, what, 2021, January, 87 agents to, to 18 months later to growing over 400, which, I, you know, I always thought that was possible. You always think it's possible, but when you get there, right, I never thought, like, oh, I never thought we, we would get here uh, because it is a big leap, right? You know, to go from 87 to 400 plus, you know, with all those obstacles, with the, with the economy, with the climate and everything going on, you know, when you get there and you take five minutes out of your day and like, oh my God, we really got here. Even though the goal was 500. Um, and what is the goal? The time it was 500. 50,000. <laughs> 50,000. So basically the whole No, we want to, I mean, you know, for us, it's not really about, it's Numbers? not, it's not strictly about the volume of agents um, or transaction count. Correct. It, it comes down to um, scalability and growing in a way where we can continue to support the agents at the same level, mm -hmm. right? So we don't want to be the biggest brokerage. We just want to have the best culture and we want to minimize the expense for the real estate agent and keep our team pretty small from the leadership standpoint. So we're not, you know, incurring all these middle manager expenses and everything else, right? Margins when it comes to real estate brokerages are fairly thin. So you have to be careful on, you know, what you do. Some people out there, they're like, oh yeah, I made X amount. I have X amount of transactions, X amount of agents. Great. What's your profitability, yeah. right? Like at the end of the day, like profitability is a big factor because yes, are we doing this because, and I shared my story at the holiday party, right? With, you know, one of the main motivators on why this is important to me to help other people, you know, get involved in real estate and then help other people invest in real estate because that, I have that kind of ingrained in me since I was a kid because that's what my dad always wanted to do. He wanted to, you know, buy a place for us and he he didn't get the opportunity to do that, right? Because he had paranoid schizophrenia. And now I have the opportunity not just to do it for us, right? And we do it, but to also grow a company that helps agents, helps consumers do that too. And I think this is, if you're, if you're leaving production to start a brokerage, to just make money, that's never going to work, yeah. right? You have to have the passion and the purpose for wanting to develop and grow people and deal with personalities. And you, you can't take anything personally because some people aren't loyal, like you said, 
a lot of people are. And sometimes you take people, what we've done, you know, from the inception of kind of, as we started growing this was we started taking on new agents. So if you're an indie broker and you're thinking about growing, you need to ask yourself, who is my ideal agent that I'm going to want at my brokerage, right? So in the beginning, we kind of just took on anybody. And when you take on brand new agents, what ends up happening is you need to have the support systems for them, which we created. But you have to understand that even when they get to a great place, making two, three hundred thousand dollars a year, they start getting recruited by other brokerages and they don't know that it's not greener on the other side. Right. Right. The grass is green where you water it. But some it's kind of like, you know, being in high school and having a boyfriend or a girlfriend and then you're in college and then you still have that boyfriend and girlfriend. But then there's all these other people and you're like, well, I only know this one because you're getting so, attention. Yeah. Right. I only know the shiny, shiny object. Right. I only know this boyfriend or girlfriend and there's all this world of people out here and now they're hitting on me just like brokers call agents and they're, they're trying to recruit them. And a lot, you know, how often does a, you know, a high schooler that goes into college with a, with a boyfriend or a girlfriend stay with that boyfriend or girlfriend and not test the waters very rarely. Right. Um, even though that boyfriend or girlfriend could be amazing and everything, sometimes they want, yeah. sometimes they want to just see what else is out there. So what we've experienced is, and we've had so many agents so saying is I should have married my high school sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> we we've had a lot of agents. We've had a lot of agents that have left the company and then have come back to the company. We just because, had a spike right now. What? We just had a huge spike of agents that left and came back. Really? Later, yeah. yeah. So I, I mean, and that's why we always leave the door open and you should never burn the bridge, you know, and if you're an agent, you should never burn the bridge leaving a brokerage either because you never know, right? You might want to come back or you might need something from that brokerage later well, down that's, the line. That's right. And it's funny and I have to just throw this out there, but, and I'm not going to mention any names, but while we were um, in the Springfield office, we had a handful of agents and some people that had left, they left on good terms and we're still friends with them and whatnot. Right. And some people, not so much. They burned the bridge. They burned the bridge. We didn't burn the it's bridge. Sometimes due to the lack of, you know, lack of maturity. Right. Where, where and, right, um, and yeah. so, and you know who this is, but I'm not going to yeah. mention any names, but now they're coming back all of a sudden they need our help. And, uh, so this one particular person has been calling and texting and Facebooking you or something about. Yeah, I mean, look, at the end of the day, like relate about this business helping is, them grow. this is a very small business right. and it's a small world, especially it's geographically driven. That's right. Right. So, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to be on the other side of a transaction, That's whether right. you're with that brokerage or not. Right. Yeah. We have 400 real estate agents and we sell thousands of homes per year. So we're going to have a listing and then you're going to be bringing a deal, right? And you're going to be bringing a buyer and we're going to be doing deals. Right. So regardless of whether you're with a brokerage or you leave a brokerage, you should always break um, up nicely, break up nicely. nicely. But nicely. at the end of the day, I think it's important, you know, as the broker, I think brokers sometimes break up bad, yeah. right? Because they take things personally, mm -hmm. right? And our model, and I, I, I used I've to been, do that. I've been guilty of that many yeah. times. Yeah, and, that, and it's that emotional. You're involved. Yeah, and you emotional. have to have yeah. you have to have the mindset of it's a small world. Yeah, and you don't want to burn the bridge. Just like you don't want them, you know, to go around saying, "Oh yeah, that broker did this, did that." Right. That's why you you don't want to have those situations. Yeah. You don't need to have those situations. It doesn't make sense. Right. Right. And a lot of times, I mean, there's there's people that have left us for the craziest reasons. Right. Um, if you're a broker, you just have to have thick skin yeah. like we had one broker specifically mentioned you know if you know john and michelle go on vacations and i'm over here struggling and that's weird to me that that is a reason that you that you decide that you're going to go somewhere so everybody shame on you for going and, on so many vacations <laughs> yeah, i mean and this person was actually doing pretty well yeah it doesn't matter what i'm saying but is I everybody just, sees through their own lens yeah. and you know it's you get people from all walks of life in this business. So if you're an independent, if you're an agent or top producer and you're, you're getting your broker's license because that's what this podcast topic is about, you're thinking about going into the space of owning a brokerage. Just know that it's totally two different skill sets. Yes. Right. So you want to increase your skill sets as a leader, as a manager, and you have to wear a lot more hats. Okay. You're going to have to wear your bookkeeping accounting hat. 
right? When you're running a brokerage, because you're going to have to have optics on your expenses and profitability a lot more so than if you were an agent and you weren't renting office space and you didn't have all these other expenses like you know policy for everybody and general liability and you know all the other expenses i mean we are we literally have so many different subscriptions and systems yeah that i could talk about i mean we use job form we use twilio we use home junction we use idx's we're subscribers to every single mls in the state as a broker right we have broker sumo we have skyslope we have adp work market for our payroll we have um, Salesforce. We have intercom for our live chat and our s support. We have Salesforce. KV we have Core. follow up boss for CRM. We have KV Core. KV Core. We have KV we have Core to offer the agents and licenses there. We have website subscriptions. We have lead subscriptions. You know, there's, there's, I think there's 49 different subscriptions that we have yeah. in order oh to God. operate a lot. everything That's in good. our. That's a lot business and you know we have three different learning management systems we have kajabi we have thinkific and we have experienceify right for different programs we have different ones we have you know our proctor exam for our exams that we have we have a, a ton of stuff Go right so, yeah i mean websites and emails on and, and giving people there. company emails yeah. and you know all yeah. that stuff the hosting there if you are going to be a broker you have to remember that you are operating at a much higher level than being an agent. And I don't think a lot of people understand that, they right? They just, yeah. oh, I'm at this brokerage and like, you know, yeah. they just have their systems. They don't know what happens behind the scenes. Yeah, and you wanna know something too. A lot of people that are going, that ha that are an agent and they want to, up their, and they're thinking about opening up their own brokerage, mm -hmm. they're under that mindset if, if you know, if I build it, they will come. That is not the case. If I open it, they'll come. Yeah. Yeah. If I build mm -hmm. the brokerage, if I open it, like it'll come. It's automatic su success. No. You're gonna have a bill a billboard in the town, and people are just gonna call you. No, that's no. not. And with that being said, we have a couple of questions from the audience, and I just want to ask the two of you guys uh, to answer them. So one, someone asked, "Do you think your experience as a real estate agent is important before entering the leadership role?" Oh. I'll answer that. Yes. Because John's never really been a realist. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yes, Mike, why don't you answer that one? John. I actually did a lot of real estate. Yeah, listings. when you were at Stryker. Yeah, but he yeah. was REO. He was REO. Well, it's a little. No, I did he, REOs. He, I did short he, sales. And I did. And we did retail yeah. because. He did retail. The way that I he got did. into real estate agency work was when the market crashed, everybody was underwater, right? Yeah. So I was marketing to buy houses. And then people would call me and they'd be like, I want to sell my house. Yeah. And I'm like, great. What do you all in your house? They're like 500. I'm like, your house is worth three, <laughs> right? They're like, yeah, but I need five because my debt is five. And then it was like, okay, well, and that was all the calls that I would get. Yeah. Like I was getting so many calls of people like, yeah, I want to sell my house. And then I would have my script and my questions and they would always owe more on their house yeah. than what it was worth. How many yeah. homes when you were a real estate agent did you sell in a year? The most? The best year. Yeah, your best year. I mean, when Randy and I were doing it together, when we had our REO account. They did a lot. Probably like 80. Yeah. It wasn't okay. that many. I mean, it's. But 80 transactions 80, is a lot of transactions. It is a lot. It is a lot. I know, John, but we, John always sets the we had an REO high. account. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Still but long. anyway, that's how I got yeah. into it. It was investing. And then it was like, well, now we got to do short sales. And then I was like, you know, we're going to just sell these properties because a lot of them were in good condition. We couldn't even, you know, you can't buy a house that you're listing. Right. So we would just list it and then we're like, wow, this is great money. Like, you know, we're selling these houses. Right. And we would just make a commission and we just kept doing that. And then the banks loved how we were working on short sales because we would have really clean packages. And then they asked us to do REOs. That's how I got into the REO yeah. business. So to answer your question, I, yes, I do believe that if you're going to start, I'm not saying that if you started a brokerage and you had no agent experience, that you're not going to be successful. Um, you can. However, I think that there are very, very few people that can make that happen. The reason why I think that you should become an agent before you start your own brokerage is because one of the hardest part about running a brokerage is navigating through personalities. And when you're an agent, you work with a lot of different clients, right? Different personalities, right? You're not just being an agent, right? It is an emotional roller coaster for most buyers, for most sellers. If you learn to adapt to certain personalities, navigate certain conversations, I think that you are more equipped to run a brokerage 
because one of the things that we do on a daily basis is really manage different people, different personalities. Everybody has a different lens, you know, and being an agent, you're going to see that. Like if you do 15, 20 transactions, you're not just working with your clients. You're working with attorneys who obviously different personalities there, listing agents, buyer's agents, depending on what side you're on, on the transaction. So it is very difficult to manage and navigate certain different personalities. And if you can, if you can hone in on that and if you can master that, I think you're one step closer to being a successful, you know, real estate brokerage owner, in my opinion. Yeah, my That's take just... is like it's economies of scale, right? So when you're small and you start a brokerage, you need to support the agents. If you don't know how to transact, Correct. if you don't know how to negotiate, if you don't know the contingencies and the clauses and the contracts and you're not familiar with all these different types of transactions because you don't have the transaction experience, how are you going to support somebody to be able to close more deals? And if you can't do it, somebody else will and they will That's leave your company at a cost. if they can't do it. So yeah. You need to be able, one of the biggest pillars of owning a brokerage is the support pillar, right? It's not writing checks for commissions. It's the support pillar. It's how am I going to help somebody that does 10 deals, get them to 20. So if you haven't done marketing, if you haven't done branding, if you haven't done prospecting, cold calling, letters, all that stuff, then how are you going to support them? You can't just rely on going on YouTube and thinking, oh yeah, I'm just going to pull these people's information and then like kind of recite it to them. That's not going to work. Right. So, so and that's a big issue. You have to have a industry. program. You have to have a training yeah. program. We've created an unbelievable program at Signature Realty where people follow and they're like, wow, this actually works. Like I went from not knowing anything about marketing and branding to actually doing it. And the biggest support issue that we've always had that is not scalable that you need to be available for if you're an indie broker is, hey, I have this situation. What do I do? And you have to be able to answer that question. It's not like, well, where's the referral form or where's this form? It, that's admin support, right? Hey, my commission check, you know, when is that coming? I just, you know, we just got it mailed to us today. When do I get the check? Those are all administrative stuff. You know, that, that you have to support too. But I mean, the, the big pillar is, is being there for the agents and helping them grow. Because I don't care what brokerage you're at. You could be on a 100% commission brokerage, right? And have like a transaction fee. But if you're not doing any transactions and the broker's not helping you grow, you shouldn't be there, right? Because if you're with us or somebody else that's actually helping you get more business, that's another $20,000, $40,000, $80,000 in your pocket, which if you're paying us 10 or 15 or 20, which are our cap programs, but we're making you an extra, we're helping you make another 80 or 100 because of what you're learning from us and the collaboration that you're having with us and the other agents at our office. That makes more sense yeah. than staying at a brokerage where you're paying them basically zero, yeah. right? Yeah. And then, you know, you're I, not gaining anything from have, it. This is a one o'clock call, so we're going to take a quick quick break and then we'll hop Well, in. me and Mike can continue yeah. and, to and talk about some of the pieces yeah. of the brokerage. So, um, Back to uh, what we were discussing before, you know, we recruit at a very high level and one of the biggest things that agents that are always on the other side of the interview or the call um, always mention is that there's a lack of support, right? I, I can't get in touch with my broker. Or I can't get in touch with the person that's, right. you know, responsible for supporting. So that's a big thing that obviously Why agents are leave. very concerned with. You know, and the good thing about us that we, we've done very, very well, which I think is one of the driving forces for why we've grown also is the fact that we've not diluted support. Right. You know, even though we have a very, very low cap, we still continue to support, right? Nine to six every day, including even Saturdays, uh, and in most cases, even on Sundays, right? So that's something that's extremely important, regardless of what, whatever the commission split is. They need the support, they want the support, they want the training. If it is a top agent, obviously that top agent wants, hey, how do I get to the next level? And if the broker or, or someone in the company has never been at that level, they're not going to be able to lead them, you know, and that's something that's extremely important for a lot of agents, right? right. And so, if you're a new brokerage, I think you're going to most likely attract a new people. Yeah, I think that's the, I mean, right. that's the if fastest way to grow. Yeah, if you're brand new, it's going to be very difficult to go and attract like agents that have been in the business for five or 10 years. Yeah. Right. You want to identify who your ideal agent is, but you also need to be realistic about who's going to come to your brokerage and what's your unique selling proposition. Yeah. Right. You know, what do, what are you offering that is better and is going to help agents get to that next level over your competition? And it can't just be a temporary thing. No. Right. Because then, you know, like, for example, some people have a mentorship program. 
right? Which we do as well, where we will hook you up with other agents at our office and you could do transactions with them. But if you just temporarily have that and then you don't have anything beyond that, they're going to leave after that. Yeah. Right. So you have to think about the whole experience journey. Um, you, you have to cater agent. to all quartiles, right? So there's three quartiles in my opinion for a brokerage, which is your top agent. Then it's your seasoned agent. Um, but they're doing five to let's say 15 transactions a year. And then you have your new agent slash agent that isn't really doing any production, right? You have to learn it. That's, I think that's one of the most difficult parts. And that was a difficult part for us in the very beginning when we were growing, you know, we felt that we were either catering too much to the new agent or catering too much to the top agent. Right. We didn't have a plan or a program in place that was catering to all three. You right. know, today we do, which is much different, but Unfortunately, you have to go through those growing pains to realize, wait a minute, why are we getting so many new agents now leaving? Wait, you know, let's put a program in place like the accelerator program, which we have, which is roughly six to eight weeks long, which we make it mandatory for all brand new agents where they get to learn the evolution of a transaction. They get to learn how to work on their business. They learn how to write up offers, how to do a buyer's consultation, all the important stuff that they really need. Right. Mm -hmm. Then we have trainings for agents that are doing, say, five to 15 transactions a year. Right. They want trainings on how to be the top agent, how to do 20 million dollars in production. And then you have, the, you know, the agent that's doing 15 to 20 million dollars, which is a top agent. What's next for them? A lot of them want to create a team or a lot of them want to work on their brand. Right. right. So you have to have trainings. You have to have people in the office that can navigate those conversations, can lead them to where they want to get, right? Facilitate. There has goals. to be a value ladder. Correct. Right. So if you're an indie broker right now and you know, you're, you're thinking about opening up an office, you need to just consider all these factors. It's not a bad idea. It's just, you need to consider all these factors. Yeah. If you love managing people and leading, and then you have to also decide, are, am I better off building a team? Yeah. Right. Because like Michelle has built a team inside of the brokerage, right? Correct. She built her team. We helped her build it. And now she has done a lot of production with her team. And, you know, some, some brokers out there or some team leaders actually are operating just as big as a team under a brokerage and in some independent brokerage, yeah. but with a lot less expenses and liability, which I think a lot of people don't kind of take into consideration. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if you get a negative review, who's going to handle that? Yep. Right. If you're getting, you know, if you have a complaint or something, you have to handle that. The broker manager is not handling that. Right. If you're mm -hmm. the owner, you're handling that. Correct. And, you know, thank God we haven't really had that many of those situations at Signature Realty, but they come up. Of course. Yeah. You know, and you you have to dedicate resources and time and energy to that. Um, we had another question. What do you think an independent real estate bro broker offers that national models cannot? Well, for me, I think it's a sense of community. You know, when yeah. I was working, and I don't want to mention the companies, but I've worked for a couple of corporate companies, right? Bigger brands, top three, top four. You know, the agents had to almost create these sub communities, these subcultures within the office. Mm. We do it a little bit different, right? Leadership team has created culture. Leader, the leadership team has created the community. Right. And what that does, in my opinion, is it makes everybody that works in your office very happy. Like I was having a conversation today, um, you know, regarding your training from yesterday. Mm. And it's an agent that's at a team, pretty big team, six people there. They're successful. And one of the things that she mentioned is there's no community. And there's that's only six people. There's no community. She goes in your training. And they're on a team. And they're on a team, wow. which that's, you know, that's a problem. Uh, but it is a reoccurring theme with a lot of teams. I see it all the time. It's a big complaint. And she goes, in your training, you know, you had, you know, 20 something people there, but I could tell that you guys have a sense of community. Right. I can tell by the way John was speaking, right? There's a sense of community. I can tell by the way the agent, which is Jacob, uh, who spoke to her, one of our agents that's managing uh, the Red Bank office, um, how he described what the, you know, what the community looks like, you know, our team building events, what does the culture look like? I think that that's extremely important. And unfortunately, the bigger box corporate type companies do not have that to offer. Right. Right. And, and we're local. Indie brokers do. Right. That's one of the benefits yeah. that I think we have too. We're local. We're in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Right. You can join a national brand and great. It has thousands of agents, but they're not in your area. Yeah. And they're not hanging out together and they're not collaborating. And sometimes they're virtual 
companies and they have no physical office to attend. No way you can have a community there for sure. Right. So it's just, it, it is more difficult. So to answer that person's question, I think as an independent brokerage locally, you can, not everything is about how big you are. No. Right. Because when you're an independent agent and you're good, you could be, you could make money anywhere. Right. Any of our top agents that are at Signature can go somewhere else and make money. Yeah. Right. And vice versa. If anybody's at any of the other brands, they can come here and they can make a lot of money. Yeah. Right. It's just a matter of, you know, what are you getting for you, where you're at in your business from that brokerage? But not just that, like the friends that you make there, the community matters. And also what the company stands for. Right. I think that's important, too. I think what a lot of people don't see, you know, we're an independently owned brokerage, right? We're private. Like we're the owners of the company, right? Like we steer the ship, right? If we have to make a change, we make the change. Yep. We can be very nimble. And I think what a lot of people don't realize when you work for some of the big companies is that the ship is steered by the earnings. Correct. Um, and their investors that are investing into that stock. Um, and you know, a small percentage, if there is stock ownership for the agents, it's very, it's typically a very, very minor share of the total shares. Correct. So they're appealing obviously to their big investors. And you hear that on their earnings calls, which is, there's nothing wrong with that, right? If you're a public company and you're driving profitability, there's nothing wrong with Correct. that. We're a business and we, we think profit is important too, but it's a little bit different than what they say i don't think it's as agent centric as most people kind of display correct you know it's a little bit different than that um so somebody asked what is your what does your day to day look like <laughs> uh fire 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 <laughs> um putting out fires well it's not just putting out fires right i mean um at some point during the day, there's always when you when you're running a brokerage with 400 plus agents, there's going to be a fire, right? That's right. just the reality. We do a lot of transactions, roughly about 130 transactions a month, so there's always going to be some sort of issue, right? Some fires are very small, some fires tend to be big, right? That's just the reality. Day to day is really focusing, you know, on operations, focusing on bottom line, focusing on growth, focusing on recruiting. Recruiting is something that obviously we're extremely focused, focused on the culture. And what I mean by culture is having team building events right. on a monthly basis, focusing on the calendar for the company. Culture is meaningless unless you actually Correct. do something about exactly. it. Exactly. Like we have team building events. Like for example, uh, next month we're going to be doing a charity event with Ola and the committee where we are raising money right. for underprivileged kids in one specific school in Roselle. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do something at Yester Kate in Westfield. And we're pickleball. Oh, yeah. Pickleball. And we're raising Which you're going to lose that again. I know I will, you know, but every month we have something going on like soccer game, softball game, kickball game, right. a toy drive, coat drive, right? We're always doing something together. And what that does is number one, it sets the right message for agents. Mm -hmm. Hey, it's, it's good to give back. Right. And number two, right. Creates a sense of camaraderie, right? People, right. other agents are helping each other. Right. Which I love. And they're doing it from the goodness of their heart. Right. Right. Which is great. I love it's that. that. Seek to serve mentality. It is the seek you to have serve to have mentality. a theme in your business. And for, for the person that asked this, you know, what does your day to day look like? You know, it should be like, what should your day to day look? What should your day to day yeah. look like? Right. So one piece of valuable information that has helped us a lot is our meeting cadence. Yeah. So when you have a business, you should have your meeting cadence. So we do daily uh, huddles where our leadership team all gets on a call at mm -hmm. 930 a.m. That's when we do it. And it typically takes about um, 30 minutes to an hour. And we go through, okay, what were our wins? What's our focus for the week if it's on a Monday? And then if it's on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, uh, we don't hold them on Fridays. Um, we say, what's your focus for the day? Correct. Right. And we're always relating back to our weekly list and any big projects. And then we also discuss critical challenges. Mm -hmm. So it's what were the wins? What was the focus for the week, the day, critical challenges? Right. So if there's something that we need to handle or some sort of situation like, you know, uh, 1099s were just due. That was a, a critical challenge that, you know, we had to make some changes on some 1099s for a few of the agents that had the wrong address and stuff like that. So things like that we bring up to the attention. It's all there. And then that way it's on the list for the day because it's a critical thing that we have to take yeah. care of. And having that daily cadence when it comes to meetings with leadership team makes a huge difference we huge difference. you know about a year ago we didn't have the same cadence and i could tell you that 
when you don't, there isn't an alignment. Right. Right. And when you guys are not aligned or when we're not aligned, you know, it, um, it creates gaps in the business, right? right. It creates gaps in operations. So when you do have these daily meetings, like we do Monday through Thursday, right. It keeps us focused, right. It keeps, um, the most important thing, the most important thing, right. right. Which is, you know, the driving force keep driving, obviously, you know, well, um, it's looking at, so we look at all of our lagging indicators, correct. right. Or sorry, our leading indicators. Okay. And then our lagging indicators, our leading indicators is okay. How many calls did we make this week? How many of this did we do? How many events are we having? We make sure all of our events are, you know, getting the right RSVPs. If not, okay, what can we do for marketing? Correct. And then we contact Nino or right, let's send an email for this. Let's send out a message on group me, et cetera. So it's really just really running the business, yeah. right? And not letting the business run you because it could be really easy for that to happen, especially when you have a lot going on and you're a producer if you're independently doing it. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm not doing any, you know, agent production. You're, I know that you refer most of your agent production out. Yeah, I stepped out, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so, you know, at a certain point, you want to say, I'm either going to run the business or I'm going to have a team. Yeah. Right. And if you have a team, this all applies, right? You should have your cadence Correct. of meetings, right? Have your daily huddles, have your weekly events, have your monthly meetings, you know, and every two weeks, you know, we're doing an, a new accounting meeting to have really good financial optics on the business. What are we spending on? What's our profitability look like? What adjustments do we need to make? Are we renewing that lease? Are we, you know, opening up this new office? What are we doing? What are we, what's our budget for the holiday party? What's our budget for this? And really, you know, running the business and keeping an eye on everything. It's really important um, to do that. So day to day is, that's what it is. It's support, it's recruiting, yeah. it's taking discovery calls, right? It's um, holding trainings and events. Today we have how to have um, an ultimate, how to have the ultimate mega open house training. So preparing for those things, making sure that everybody's going to get the resources, making sure that everybody's got the link and the registration for it. I mean, it's everything. It's recognition, right? You have to recognize your agents. This morning I was in Ridgewood and, you know, making sure that everything is good for our grand opening that's coming up. Yeah. So, you know, it's just, it's look, having your to-do list and your projects, right? And then saying, okay, what am I going to focus on today? You know, um, our, our theme this year is win the day, right? If you win the day, you win the weeks, you win the weeks, you win the months, you win the months, you win the quarter, you win the quarter, you win the year. Right. And you need to, as a business owner, nobody's telling you to wake up and do this or do that. So for us, you know, it's easy to procrastinate if we don't hold each other accountable, if we don't have our cadences. So, you know, regardless of how motivated we are, that, that habitual discipline of a meeting cadence is very valuable for productivity. Yeah. And I, and I believe everybody should do it. You know, if you're, if you're an individual agent, it's tough. Yeah. That's why we have daily huddles. We, we actually have Monday, money Mondays. Um, we have tech Tuesdays, tech Tuesdays. we have Wednesdays, winning Wednesdays, tactical, tactical Thursdays. Thursdays and finesse Fridays. Every day we do a meeting at 10 AM with the entire company, um, to basically talk about different topics and to motivate everybody because we know how important it is to stay engaged on a daily basis and learn something new. Yeah. And to get reinvigorated every Sometimes day. you need it, right? As an agent, as a leader, as a business owner, you have to, right? It's, our, it's a roller coaster ride, right? right. It's peaks and valleys with this business, you know? Um, so we'll end it on one last question. What strategies do you use for recruitment? So there's a lot of strategies that you can implement. Um, one of the things that John Cheplak, who's a fantastic coach, a great mentor uh, to both of us, is you should lead agents better than their current leader. And what does that ultimately mean, right? Give resources, give trainings, give better advice to agents that are not working under your brokerage so that way, if they feel that they need a change, you are top of mind. Right. So let, let people experience your brokerage. I think, I think the easiest way to do it is if you hold a training and we do this, we'll invite agents that we're, that we're talking to mm -hmm. and say, hey, listen, you're not with us. Just attend one of our trainings. And if you're watching this and you're a New Jersey agent and you're interested in attending some of our trainings to kind of see what it's like, kind of try it before you buy it kind of concept. Yeah. Um, you can come to some of our trainings and that way you can experience what our culture is like and who we are and what type of valuable information behind the curtain there is, right? So 
if you're an indie broker, that's something that you should consider doing. Yeah. Do a good job with your culture. Um, make your current agents a raving fan of your brand, of your company. Right. And give so, them an incentive yeah. to recruit. Correct. And give them an incentive to recruit so they can attract agents as well or introduce agents over to, to you or whoever handles, obviously, discovery calls. So that's another important thing that should be done. Another thing that we're doing right now that we're going all in uh, in many aspects is, you know, if obviously if you have transactions like we do, congratulate the other agent on the other side of the transaction, especially right. if it was a great transaction, right? They want to be congratulated. Uh, send them a postcard, send them a thank you uh, a text, send them a, a thank you email. Right. They're going to respect it. And appreciate it. And they're going to appreciate it. And here, here's what's going to happen. You never know who is thinking of a change. Right. Right. And what happens when agents, and I've been there, when you're thinking of a change, it's whoever's been top of mind in the last 30 to 45 days. It's whoever's done a good job at, you know, training or leading them like John Cheplak says. It's whoever who's been engaging with them, right? Mm -hmm. Without asking for anything back, right? We're not saying, hey, you know, congratulations. Thank you for the closing or thank you for the experience journey. Uh, if you're thinking about leaving, give us a call. That's not what we do. Right. We're just truly just congratulating them. And that's it. We, we leave it there, right? right? We just want to be on their radar if in the event they ever decide that they're thinking about a change, right? right? So that's a thing that we now are going all in and I think that it's great. Um, you know, another thing that agents or brokers can do is obviously do discovery uh, webinars or any right. type of networking event. You know, we were doing a lot of uh, culture. What was it? A culture events culture. that we had at the uh, at the office in Somerset. We had our agents invite other agents right. to to come and experience what the culture looks like. Right. And that helps. We did recruit a lot of people from those events which leads me to believe we should go back to it um, at some point. No, there's yeah. a lot of stuff that you can do for recruiting. It's just a matter of like what your company does. Hi, I got the listing, so sorry, I had to step out. Welcome back. All right, um, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for, thanks for uh, tuning in to Signature SIP Podcast and subscribe and you can check us out on Spotify and YouTube. Thank you. Thanks, Gomes, for having me for having yourself. <laughs>